I'm going to be towing, t showing you how to build your very first connector in our SAS connectivity framework. So if you haven't done that yet, this is a great session for you. Even if you have done that before, uh, there's probably some things you'll learn today. So I hope you uh, really enjoy this session that I'm about to show you right now. So the thing I'm going to start with is just going into the documentation, because that's where you always start when building a SAS connector. And it has everything you need in order to get started doing this. So let's jump in real quick. If you go to our uh, homepage, developer.salepoint.com, and then go to our documentation. Here you'll see the connectivity section. And you can click on here. It gives you a nice overview. And I'll just start off kind of just talking about it a little bit in case you haven't heard of it or don't know what SAS connectors are. Uh, really, we have two ways of connecting in Identity Security Cloud. One is through the SAS connectors, which I'm going to show you today. And the other way, the other approach, is through the VAs, which is kind of the traditional approach of connecting uh, to external sources. Uh, when you're using the VA, you're always going to be going into your internal network. So Identity Security Cloud will reach into your internal network connect to that VA, and then that VA makes all the calls out to your various uh, sources. And there's a nice little diagram here that you can see that's basically showing how that works. So here it's saying Identity Now. We've recently changed Identity Security Cloud. But that'll reach out to the VA. Here's the, this, this part of the picture right here is showing the VA. And then any data sources, these are your on-prem data sources, and then th these would be your cloud connected data sources. And so again, this is the traditional approach. This is how most customers have a VA and are connecting to their sources in this way. If we go down to SaaS connectivity, uh, that's kind of a direct connection directly to cloud sources. So in this scenario, you've got uh, depicted Identity Now, like I said, Identity Security Cloud, and that SaaS connectivity framework running there and then connecting directly to other cloud sources. So the real advantage here is if you have a cloud source that you want to connect to, you can go directly from Identity Security Cloud to those cloud sources. So that's where the that's a really big advantage of SaaS connectivity right now. And you know, since we have a lot of SaaS connectors available, out of the box connectors, and then of course you can also build your own, your own connectors, most implementations are going to have an architecture that looks similar to what we have here when it comes to connectivity. Where you have Identity Security Cloud able to connect to the VA, and then that VA will then connect to all your on-prem sources. And you also have SaaS connectivity, that SaaS connectivity layer and your SaaS conne uh, connectors that can then connect directly to your cloud sources. So today, we're going to be uh, creating a custom SAS connectivity uh, connector. There are a lot of out-of-the-box connectors available, and you can see all those on documentation.salepoint.com. They are broken out so you can see which ones are going to run in the SAS connectivity layer versus the ones that run on the traditional VA layer. But yeah, like I said, today we'll, we'll actually build one from scratch, a custom one. And so when you go into this documentation, it'll kind of show you all the steps that you need to take to do that, and we're going to walk through that today. And we'll start with the prerequisites. And just so you know, uh, you do need to have Node installed. I already have that on my computer, so no issues there. And you also have to have the SailPoint CLI installed. And we've already done some uh, workshops on that during this week, so feel free to take a look at those if you don't know how to install or get started with the CLI. Uh, it's not very difficult, though, so I already have that installed. And I'll kind of show you and walk through the commands that you would use when using the CLI. And then, of course, most users uh, are going to use an IDE. Uh, everything we do here is in Visual Studio Code, so you'll see me using that IDE today. Uh, Postman is also a very important part of the toolkit. Not required. There's a lot of other ways that you could go about doing it, but we do provide a uh, Postman collection that you can use with your connectors, and we'll see that in a little bit too. But the very first thing you need to do when creating a con connector is using the CLI to issue this command right here. So sale con init my first project. And I'm going to copy this out and open up my PowerShell window. And let's see, we won't have this open up for long, but I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. 
I did copy that, so I can paste it here. And for this one, I suppose we can call it whatever we want. This is going to be the uh, solar eclipse. I just decided that right now. <laughs> 2002 4 connector. So it's a fun name for us. And as you can see, I just created that connector and it created the whole project structure for me. I can go into that and then I'm immediately going to open up Visual Studio Code. That's what that code period command does. And you can see I've got Visual Studio Code open. I'll make that a little bit bigger for us. Hopefully that's big enough for everyone to see. And the project structure is available right here on the left. I'm just going to really quick look at our documentation, make sure that we have everything. You can see it talks about the source files that are created. And you can go into a little bit more detail as to what these different source files uh, represent inside the project. And our next step is going to be testing the connector and building and deploying. So we're going to do that right now. The first thing you need to do before you can even test the connector is you need to actually get all your dependencies. So I'm going to do that by going into the terminal. So we now have a terminal that we can use. And we use uh, uh, package.json to keep track of all the dependencies that we need. And we just issue an npm install. And that will go ahead and start installing all of those dependencies. While that's running, I'll just kind of show you how that actually works. If you've never used npm before, or if you're not familiar with it, you can see it kind of lists out you know, the most important dependency here, the sale point connector CLI, there's some dev dependencies that we also use. But it's going to go ahead and grab all of those, and they're all going to end up going into your node modules directory. You will also create a package lock.json. You see that just got created right there. And that package lock.json will kind of tell you exactly which versions of every dependencies got installed. And that's so that when you, in, during a CI CD process, when you're actually building your connector, it can kind of pin to those specific versions. And that way you're not getting any surprises by upgrades that may happen on your different packages. So, got that installed. And now we should be able to look at the code and all of our dependencies should be resolved in there. You can see they are. I was able to import all these different commands from the sale point connector SDK. And kind of, we can look at this code a little bit, but first let's just actually try running it. And if I go down here, you can see there's a couple of commands, npm run dev. There's also, if I go back into my package.json, this is just a good way to understand what types of um, scripts can be run. So as it mentioned in the documentation here, there's npm run dev. There's also an npm run debug, and I'll talk about that in one minute. And then, of course, the other commands to pack and build and zip your, uh, uh, your connector up so that you can deploy it to the cloud. So let's just get started by running that npm run dev command. And we should see our connector starting up here. Just wait for this thing to get going, and there it is. Okay, so now you can see it's actually running, and it's watching for file changes, which means that I can make changes to my code, and it'll recompile and continue to run for me, so I don't have to keep building and recompiling the code. And now that it's running, I can actually go into Postman and start uh, testing these commands. So I'm just going to show you real quickly. If you go up... Let's see into SAS connectivity. Here's that Postman collection. You can click here and find your Postman collection. If you download that, then you'll see in Postman this SAS connectivity um, collection. And then inside this collection, there are customizer commands, which we're not going to go over right now, but I have a session in a couple hours that's going to go over that. 
there are the connector commands, which we are going to go over right now. So we'll see those running in one minute. They're all laid out so that you can easily kind of test each command that's implemented in the connector. And I'll show you that real quick. So for every connector, you can implement optionally all these different commands. When you first initialize a connector from the CLI, you'll get three of these commands implemented for you in a static way. So if I go back to my connector really quick, you'll actually see in this index, you'll see three of those commands. So you'll see the test connection command, the account list command, as well as the account read command. So those are the three that are implemented for you, although they don't really do much right now, but we're gonna test them and see how they run real quick. So first we'll start with this test connection command. In our Postman collection, you can see they're laid out just like you'd expect, test connection, count list, count read, etc. And there's also a config component to this, which you'll see that in one second. So if I run this, then you can see I get a successful run. If I were to say change this to tokens and then try running it, then you'll see I get a connector error. And that's because included in the default implementation is a requirement for at least this one config item, which is token. And so I can change that back to token and run it again. And if you look at where that's implemented, you'll see in the very start here, it will create a new client and pass that config item in. And if I go into that constructor, then you'll see it's actually looking for config.token. And if that returns undefined, then it throws an error. So that's the exact error that we saw here. And well, it's not there anymore. I can replicate it again though for you. Yeah, that's the exact error that you saw there and you can kind of see it also shows you where that line of code happened. So my client.ts in line 34. If I go back, then you'll see that line 34. So this can be a helpful way to kind of see, okay, what's going on with my connector? Something failed and now you can uh, go and actually see the line number where it failed at. Get that back to working again so I don't lose my state of mind there. So now that we have this at least testing in one place on the test connection, uh, the next thing we want to do is figure out how can we debug this by setting breakpoints in our application. So if I go back here, I'd like to actually set a breakpoint right here uh, and run this. Right now it's not going to do anything, but we can make that happen pretty easily. So I'm going to turn this off and I can open up a JavaScript debug terminal. This is the easiest way to get debug breakpoints and it's quite effective. And now I can run a command npm run debug. So the only thing different about this command is that now you're going to see this debugger attached show up here. And then it's going to start the connector. So the connector is once again started. My breakpoint is here. And if I run the same command again, you'll see it actually stops on that breakpoint. And so now I can start to add watches here if I want. So I can look at that config object and I can see the values inside of it, which can be helpful, again, if you're building a connector to be able to just stop and hit breakpoints in the code and see what's going on. This is my preferred way. Some people like writing console logs, which you're uh, more than welcome to do, but it's sometimes nice to actually be able to stop at a particular place in the code and take some time using watch or just hovering over different variables to see what the actual values are, what the state is of it, especially when you've got more complicated loops or you know objects that are represented and maybe you don't understand exactly how they're represented until you run the code. It just saves some time to do that. So. Definitely recommend that. And then on the top here, you've got your debug panel. So you can step over commands into or just continue. In this case, we'll just continue. And we've gotten our message back. So uh, demonstrated how we can at least get started uh, running the connector. Let's now just take a minute to implement a couple of these commands in a more proper way. It's still gonna be, not going to be 100% proper, 
but I thought it'd be good again to just go into a little a little deeper here so you can kind of get how you would go about implementing this with a simple web service call. Uh, one of the tools that I'm going to use is this JSON placeholder. So this is a nice kind of set of API calls that are open that you can use to test different things out. So in this case, we've got this nice user method here. And it also has 10 users built into it. So this is a great way to test or to kind of figure out how we can implement a connector here. So I'm going to do that now. You can actually take this user's call out whoops, and go into our connector again. We have our client implementation right here. We'll just keep the token the way it is. That's fine. But now on test connection, let's actually implement something here. So what we'll actually do is let's use fetch for this. So we'll just stick with something simple. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Well, we've got to get used to this keyboard. It's uh, really sensitive to key presses, which is nice. <clears throat> so let's do a response. Oh, look at that. It's even uh, auto-filling some of this for me. Okay. And then we can say if that's probably good. Response.json. All right, so we'll just kind of check that data and maybe even log it out. Just so we can get an idea of what came out. And then if that all works okay, then we can return that array. And if not, oh, <clears throat> then we can just throw a connector error. And it kind of knew to do that already. So failed to cast, con cast connection. And who knows why. We could maybe even do some other things like else. And we could say something else like uh, Instead of failed test, test connection, you can say uh, received non 200 response from API. That could be nice. Um, it looks like actually, yeah, this is not really necessary anymore. But what we might want to do is do something like a try catch here. And just bring all this stuff up inside the try catch. And then in here, throw that connector error. And that way we have some decent error handling on this that should take care of any issues that we, that we encounter. All right. So I got that saved. And our connector is still running. So let's try this out and see what happens. We're already on the test connection. All right, so we got a 200. The only difference now is that it should be making a call out to the API, and we should get a console log of that result, and we do. So now we've got a real test connection. X actually making an API call out, ensuring that this endpoint actually exists and works. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Now let's uh, implement this as well on our get accounts, get all accounts, actually. So this is really going to be almost the same thing. So I'm going to copy this out of here. Paste that in. And now the only thing we want to return is data. Uh, so there's one thing that I want to talk about here. And that's obviously, you know, this is just an any data type. And that'll work just fine. But we would like to use uh, typing in TypeScript. That's the whole point of it. So let's kind of build that out a little bit. And one of the tools that I like to use for that, something that I found, is I can copy this user's response that I get back into a tool called JSON to TypeScript. I can just paste this in 
and it's going to give me, it's going to take that JSON object and convert it to a TypeScript object or type, which is pretty nice. I can just copy all of this out and I'll go back into my connector code and I'll add a new source file called user.ts and I'll paste that in here and we probably don't need this array root thing. Instead of calling it root2, we'll call it user. I think that'll work pretty well. So now we have our user object and you can see how this is kind of a nested JSON object. It would have been a lot to have to build all this on our own, but by pasting it into that tool, it just kind of created the entire object model for us. And so that's nice. And if I go back to my client now, then let me actually bring that in. <clears throat> oh, whoops. Not there. That should work a little bit better. Uh, you can see I get a little error here because obviously I need to return that user object and also that's going to be an array of users. So I got that figured out. And if I go back to my get all accounts method implementation, or sorry, where it gets called, then you can see there's some errors in here now too. But the nice part is now when I hover over this, it says, hey, my accounts are now an object of type user array. So this is gonna make this part of the step a whole lot easier. <clears throat> you can see, oh yeah, there's ID. I can see all the different fields that I can access in here. So I'll take ID. And I think, yeah, the error here is that UID has to be a string whereas this is a number. So again, just nice to be able to have that all figured out for you. So we'll make that to string. And of course, first name doesn't actually exist. So we just have name here. I guess we could uh, split this. So I have the first name. I think that is gonna work out okay because we have Name, yeah, so it's just the full name. So there's a last, first name, space, last name in this. So that should work just fine. And then we can do the same thing here. Except we'll just take the second element. Hopefully that doesn't cause any issues. And uh, we probably have some other attributes in here as well that we can use. So we've got name, email, street, city, yeah, so let's just put a couple of these extra ones in there. Street account dot dress dot street. And then what else do we have in there? City, yeah. It even account dot address dot city. All right, so we have a couple additional attributes getting sent out through this connector as well. So standard account list. I think everything's implemented there. Uh, let's take a look at this and see how it does. So we'll go into our connector commands again. We'll look at our account list command and go ahead and send this off. And yeah, just like that, we have a list of 10 different user accounts and we have that city and street that we added in there as well. That's pretty cool. Let's implement get account. This one's going to be a lot easier. I can just copy all of this out just like before. <clears throat> the only difference here is we can probably just kind of for user of data. Yep, that'll work. Return user. Yep, okay, cool. Um, and then, yeah, it's even giving us a nice account not found message in case we never match up with that identity. And instead of promise any, we will return of type user. And then we'll go back into our index here. 
and we just need to implement it for account read, which again is going to be very similar. So I'm going to make this pretty simple. I think I can copy out everything inside. Just want to make sure that I don't mess up my copy paste. All right, perfect. And so now if I go to my account read command, let's see what I have for identity. We'll have to adjust this a little bit. I think it, now I can't remember what I'm going to be searching on. Nope, not that one. It says uh, failed the test connection. <clears throat> Let's see here. Account read. Input identity. Oh. No, that's right. Yeah, identity one. Config API key. Input dot identity. Oh, and we, so we threw an error here somewhere. Uh, let's see here. Now, well, this is a great time to actually step through and see what's going on, so. That's part of the process, really. I'm going to just make sure that I've got my all my source code. I've noticed that sometimes when you go to debug and you made a lot of changes, it doesn't catch up. So just to make sure we've got it in the right state, I'll just rebuild it real quick. And then let's actually step through, because this is a great time to test this, actually, and see what's going on. We know that this one up here works. This one does not for some reason. It's probably not going to be anything too difficult to debug. <clears throat> so we'll send this, and we stop right here. Okay, response is okay. We loop through. Let's see what our identity is. It's one. Our username is, ah, okay. So obviously, it's eventually not going to find this because I need to use one of these usernames. So I'm going to copy this one out. I'm kind of curious, though, because I thought it through a different error. Oh, I see. It's inside the, yep, so it's going to throw that error, and then it's going to throw the other error and say failed the test connection. So that makes sense now. <clears throat> so probably should change that implementation a little bit, but we're not going to worry about it for now. Kind of threw me off though, though, so you can see why that's important. So now if I put a different identity in there, one that actually works, and I send this. Oh, that's right, I have that, my breakpoint. So let's remove that and loop the rest of the way through. And now we get that user back. So great, works perfectly, excellent. Uh, so now we have this connector, it's actually fully implemented. We have get all account accounts, we can get rid of this mock data, we don't need this anymore. When I say fully implemented, we have three commands, the ones that it came with fully implemented. But still, it's better than nothing. I'm going to show you now, I want to just step away from the development process a little bit, because really implementing the other commands is fairly similar. You're just going to keep doing what I did, only it gets a little more complicated when you're creating an account. But uh, again, you kind of get the idea, I think, and I want to use this time that we have now to kind of show you some other parts of this implementation process. So go ahead and stop this debugger. And if we go back into our documentation, get out of these connector commands, we'll get the build, test, and deploy section. So we already went over the testing. Uh, but now we need to build this thing. So npm run pack zip. That'll take care of that process. So we'll run that command, and we don't really have to sit around and watch it. But the next thing we need to do is create this connector in our org. So that's where this comes in salecon create my project and while that's building we can open up another window here and run that command and what did I call this again it was solar eclipse 2024 so we can go ahead and create this and once I do that you see it gives me an ID it gives me an alias and now this connector exists in uh, in our Identity Security Cloud platform. So it should be up there, but there's no code bound to it, so it's not going to do anything yet. But as soon as this build finishes, 
which it's still running, we can actually upload the connector code to this. And so while that continues to build, we're just going to look over here and see what's next. We can see a list of the connectors and that would show up in there. And then the next thing we need to do is to upload this. So this is where we do the salecon upload command. And I'm going to go ahead and copy this one out. And we just need to change a couple things in here. The connector ID is going to be solar eclipse 2024. And then our file name. Let's see if that finished. Oh, whoops. All right, it did. Because now the file exists, so that means that if I go over here, you'll see, yep, it was able to successfully pack and zip that file up. And now I can upload it to Identity Now, so I'm going to do that right now. And there we go. So now we have a connector. It's up in Identity Now. We should be able to use it and test it. Uh, we can even demonstrate that really quickly if you want to. I already have uh, my tenant open and go to admin and then da, 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 connections sources and we'll create a new source we can name this we've got to look for it first and there it is configure don't really need a different description and I'll make myself the owner. All right, configuration. Just put any old token we want in there. And then review and test. Okay, so the test was successful. We can go back to the source page even. And if we would like to, we can go and import the data for that so I can start an aggregation. And it's kind of cool what's happening right now because in just a matter of a couple minutes, I was able to you know, deploy this thing up into Identity Security Cloud. And now I've just aggregated and now we should have those 10 accounts showing up, which we do. So you can see how easy it is to deploy a custom connector directly to your tenant. And in just a few seconds, it's operating. It's ready to go. That's pretty cool. Um, the other thing I want to show is how you can test this tenant or this uh, this connector. So the last con uh, command I want to look at is this. Well, not the invoke command, but let's see here. If I go to common CLI commands, this is a really helpful page because it has pretty much all the CLI commands that you'd ever need to use in order to. Uh, deploy your connector. But under this testing and debugging section, there's this run read only integration test against your connector. So this is kind of nice. <clears throat> the only thing I need to do to create to run this command is create this config.json. So I'm going to do that really quick. If I go back to my file explorer, just create a simple config.json. And in here we just need a token and as I said, it doesn't really matter what it says because we're not even looking at it for anything so now that that's created I can go back here and I can use this validate command and this is actually going to run through and it's, it's actually going to invoke the connector in your uh, identity security cloud tenant so you'll see it invoking it you'll see it running commands against it it's just a nice way to be able to test your commands to make sure that you implemented them correctly. And again, we just need to, whoop, dash C, solar eclipse 2024. And this should actually validate that my connector works properly. And hopefully it does. Um, I actually do expect to see a couple of issues. And yeah, so the one thing I want to note here and this is why this is really helpful. You'll see it says, hey, warning, additional attributes found, street and city. And this is where we get into how this thing implements. So even though we're sending that stuff back, uh, Identity Security Cloud, it doesn't know about those fields until you define them. And that's where this connector spec comes into play. And we haven't talked about this yet. 
But the connector spec tells uh, Identity Security Cloud about your connector and what it can do. So if I look at this, you see right now I support these three commands. I'd love to support more than that, but we probably won't have enough time to go over any more of those. And then in this source config, this is where we can also define the different menu items that are in here. So this is kind of cool because here we can do type text. And if I go back to our documentation real quickly, look at our connector spec file. In here, you can kind of see the different types of field types that are supported in here. Uh, text is one of them. Also, secret is one of them. So I'm going to change this to a secret because really a token should be a secret anyway. I'll change that. And then I can add one more too just for fun so you can see how things get updated. <clears throat> Instead of token, I'll call it URL. And this type will be text. And if you want to understand how these other ones get implemented, most of them are the same as what you just saw. And then the ones that are a little more complicated, there's actually examples. So if I go to this radio button, you can kind of see it shows, oh, this is how you define the options in a radio button. And there's a little example there for you. So that makes it um, pretty easy to implement these if you want to do those types. And then the last uh, section I want to go over real quick here is the account schema. So if we go down a little further, you can see this account schema exists here. And this is where those fields are defined for us. So if you remember, it was kind of yelling at us because there was city and street implemented. So let's actually add those in. Street and city. Type string, and then we can just say Whoop. and city. Won't spend too much time going around that. And so now, if I go ahead and run this, I should get a different result back. Before I can run it, though, before I can run it with the new configuration, I need to do something. Oh, you know what? I did that in this. I need to pack and zip it. So we'll wait for that to finish, and then I need to re redeploy it so that we can actually test that happening. So we'll wait for that to finish, and then we can test it one more time. And I'm going to try and move this over a little bit because I noticed that I think that this, because I made everything bigger, this table usually looks nicer. But because I've made my screen bigger so you can actually see everything, it's uh, a little difficult to see. Oh, that's weird. I know I had those other commands in there. Here we go. We'll wait for this one to finish. Should be done in a few seconds here. And then we can redeploy and retest the actual connector in Identity Now. Or Identity Security Cloud. I gotta, I'm still trying to like remember that in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's run this command now. So this will upload it. And you can see now it's version 2. And this happens immediately. So when you upload it, now the connector that's even that I just created is also on version 2. So if I go in real quick over to here, and I go to the configuration tab. Then immediately I see those additional fields that I created. So I test in here. And this is actually stored as a secret. Now one thing to note, if I were to uh, issue a Postman call to look at this connector and look at the configuration for this connector, the encrypted field will not actually be there until you resave it. So. Right now it's not encrypted even though it's showing up as the little password dots. When I click save, then it will actually refresh with that new field. And you can kind of see that now too. See it's got like, now it's got like this big huge list. If I go back and back in, then you'll see now you can definitely tell that this is an encrypted field based on how everything gets displayed on here. Okay, so done with that and let's 
actually test it now. Validate. And hopefully I made it wide enough that our table shows up nicely too. But I don't know if that's... Oh yeah, it did. That's nice. And you can see now we've passed this and there's no errors at all because I added those in two new fields in the account schema, which is really nice. So we could implement these other commands, the entitlement read, entitlement list. Uh, but since we don't have much time left, I'm going to show one other thing. Hopefully I'll have enough time to finish to show this because um, another thing to be aware of when building connectors is that a lot of times you are paginating through thousands and thousands of accounts potentially uh, or identities. And so you want to make sure that when you're doing that, if you have some network errors or something like that, that your whole connector doesn't just crash and it's like, oh, couldn't connect, done. You might be like three hours into some kind of a, you know, operation and then it fails. So one of the things that you can do is implement some retry logic. And so what we'll do is just implement Axios here. So npm <clears throat> install Axios. We'll let that install. I probably should have installed them together, but. And then Axios dash retry. And because we're short on time, I do actually have some code that I can just paste over here just to show how this would work. So first thing we want to do is just import these two things. Oh, it's in, in my client, of course. So we'll import the Axios methods. And then in the constructor, part of the code, we also want to use Axios retry. And you can see here that I've implemented retries three, exponential delay. And if you see this 429, then keep retrying, okay? And then the last thing I'm gonna do is just down in this test connection, I'll just show you really quickly. I already have a web request set up Uh, right here with a 429 that's automatically going to get sent back. But again, just to demonstrate how this can work, if I now start this connector up, and if I go back up to where I implement this, you'll see that if I see this status code of 429, then I'm going to say, hey, rate limited, let's retry. You may also check for other status codes or other errors that may happen while running the connector. And uh, that'll allow you to handle like network outages or whatever might happen while you're running this connector. So this is, I think, a pretty important step to take whenever you're building a connector, just handling these different kind of error uh, events that can occur while running the connector. Because some of these you want to run for a really long time. All right, so that's implemented. We have test connection here. Uh, we're probably, yeah, I'll have a chance to run it one time for you. And if I run this, it's running, it's running, it's running, and then it fails. And it fails because that request is going to send back 429s over and over again. But you can see on the bottom here, rate limited, retrying. And it tried it three times. And then after the third try, it said, all right, I'm not going to try anymore. Uh, I'm done. I'm going to throw an exception and then exit this whole thing. So that just kind of gives you an idea of how you can implement that. I know I didn't get to actually write the code, but I think you can kind of see how it is. And if you want an example of this actually implemented in a real connector, there's the discourse connector, which is referenced in our docs. Uh, let's see here, example connectors right here. This discourse connector actually implements Axios in that same manner. So you can kind of get an idea of how that retry logic can be used. Okay, so with that, I think, uh, we've, I think we've got pretty far. We were able to put together a full connector, deploy it to Identity Security Cloud. We were able to test it out and do the integration testing on it, as well as implement some retry logic. I thought that was, uh, that's a really good, uh, really good state to be in after just 45 minutes. So thank you for joining me during this call. And I guess I will 
See you in my next session where I talk about customizers.